I think all sensible people have the British Constitution as one of their hobbies. It is the most interesting uh, matter to, to discuss and be informed about. As Dicey said, Dicey argued, it is Parliament that is the defender of the liberties of the people, of our ancient constitution and of our freedoms. I, I give way. Hello, this is Jacob Rees-Mogg once again. The question of why Parliament works applies not just in the UK, but in countries around the world which are transitioning to democracy and developing their democratic institutions. Each country has its own history and context, of course, but the UK's experience, the slow development of our constitution and Parliament's role within it over many centuries is something we have to offer as a nation as part of our Global Britain efforts. Joining me for this week's episode is Shannon O'Connell, Director of Programs at the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, WFD, which does so much to share the UK's parliamentary expertise with the rest of the world. Shannon, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Another Member of Parliament who shares my great love for the Chamber of the Commons is Jim Shannon, my guest for the last episode. Jim has shown how much he values the Chamber of the Commons by spending an enormous, an inordinate, a phenomenal amount of time in it. Yeah, I mean, it's an incredible privilege and and, an incredible honour to be the Member of Parliament. Uh, I'm... No, there wouldn't be one day, Jacob, one day in my life at Westminster when I walk across that bridge from a hotel that I don't say, wow, big, big wow. It's, 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 it's incredible. Shannon, perhaps I might start by asking you what it is that fascinates those in countries so different to ours about the UK's parliament. Hmm, that's a really good question. I think there are a lot of different aspects of the UK parliament that are fascinating, certainly intriguing to other parliaments and other political actors around the world, as some of which you referred to in your introduction, the gifts of time, uh, stability, and a certain level of uh, income that has allowed the UK parliament to develop its uh, frameworks, its constitution, its ways of operating, and to learn uh, from things going well and not going so well. So uh, the House of Commons has been there for a very long time. The whole of the parliament ha- has, and uh, these institutions have ridden out quite a few storms, uh, which has allowed them to innovate. And it is the learning that comes from those innovations that is proven quite valuable around the world. Uh, so you've got things like uh, select committees, of course, uh, which have been adopted by a number of parliaments. Uh, the process of electing rather than appointing committee chairs. Uh, But then there's also things like the physical building and how you take an older estate and you create something or you try to transform it into something that feels accessible uh, to people as as citizens. Um, So all of these these things, the, uh, the traditions that the House of Commons have created, the very cool rules of procedure, these are something that have been referred to by speakers of parliaments in other countries as sources of important reference that they have turned to. Uh, we've heard this from the speakers of parliaments in Malaysia and Sri Lanka. Um, when they are drawing their Venn diagram of how are we going to solve this problem, uh, the UK parliament will be one of the circles in their Venn diagram. OK, how did they do this? Um, we've also had uh, stories or, or indications from uh, the the parliament in, in Lebanon, for example, uh, saying we uh, when they were looking at how they would address the extractive industries through the parliament, they the speaker uh, told WFD, we know we don't want to do it the way that the UK parliament has, but we do want to look at that example so we can learn from it. So it creates a, a very interesting point of contrast um, and valuable learning resource. And, and not to belabor the point too much on this, but there's also this issue of visibility and the theater of the place. Uh, 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 Prime Minister's questions are watched by audiences around the world. Uh, the theater of the institutions uh, is fantastic and attractive to many audiences. And how do we... Um show what's good about our own parliament and encourage other countries to see what we've done that works without appearing to be condescending about it and saying, 
we know best. How, how do you promote mm. democracy tactfully? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the current situation, the current political situation globally offers uh, the right environment <laughs> Uh, to approach all of this work as equals, as partners, and with humility, uh, we are in a place where nobody is really winning the democracy game right now. And there are a lot of very important lessons to be learned about what it means to serve citizens right now, what it means for citizens to feel that they are represented and included uh, and how we manage crises uh, in what feels like an age of decline in democratic systems. So uh, the current situation, I think, is, is creating a very natural equality. Um, I also think that the, the UK, uh, just as a global actor, has uh, softened its approach um, very much uh, in, the, in the last, in recent decades in particular, uh, and choosing to be uh, a partner as well as a leader on a number of issues, uh, things like preventing sexual violence uh, in conflict is one area where the UK is offering both partnership and leadership at the same time. And where do you think um, it goes when Westminster has its problems? I mean, obviously, over the last few years, there have been some scandals involving MPs, the expenses scandal particularly, but also elements of the Me Too scandal have hit mm -hmm. Westminster. Does that undermine the growth of democracy more broadly? Or do people look at that and say, well, um, that's not about the fundamentals of democracy. That's just about the misbehavior of individuals or groups of people. I think it's a little bit of both. Um, that when you look at situations like uh, the expenses scandal, or uh, I'm speaking to you today from Northern Ireland, having worked in the Northern Ireland Assembly as well. Uh, we had recently the Renewable Heat Initiative and issues over that, um, as well as different issues about whether COVID regulations were being uh, ignored by certain parties. The, the bottom line always comes down to accountability. And I think that is a unique selling point for the UK political system uh, and parliamentary institutions that ultimately the buck does stop. It does, there is accountability, there is responsibility. Uh, it's not a completely clean record on that, but that is one of the areas where I think the UK does offer a distinct experience. There is an expectation that there are rules and that most of the time the rules are followed. And when they are not, there are consequences. Um, and I think that is a useful model for other systems that are endeavoring to see more equality in the rule of law. And what do you think we can learn the other way around, that mm. particularly with engagement with other countries? And, and this doesn't have to be countries that are developing democracies. It could be ones that are quite mature democracies. What do you think we can see in our own systems that could be approved, improved? I think perhaps one of the areas to look is the conversation around the sustainable development goals. Um, and again, going back to the current health crisis that we're in, which is also an economic crisis, which is also a systems crisis, uh, that uh, for a long time, the conversation around the sustainable development goals had been uh, among the G7 nations, that that was someone else's business. Uh, we are now, it, it, it's nice, we're, we're there, we'll show up for the conversation, but this really isn't a problem for us. Uh, we are now looking at forecasts where as early as next year, uh, potentially another 97 million people could be entering new people, uh, entering extreme poverty. And that is undoubtedly a, a global problem. Uh, we have commitments uh, to address a number of these issues by 2030. Uh, the situation with COVID, though, is adding additional complexity. Uh, and when you apply any sort of, of intersectional lens, looking at who is most hard hit, um, I think that some countries that are um, would be considered uh, newer democracies or developing political systems 
are more likely to take the lead on that intersectional analysis. Uh, so whether or not women and girls are more profoundly affected by what's going on, for example, or who is living in extreme poverty. And that is a place where I think uh, the UK, as we are building new forms of, of policy response and responding to citizen needs, could perhaps um, learn a few things and collaborate very effectively with global partners. And in terms of prosperity and democracy, it's a slightly chicken and egg question. Mm. But which do you think comes first? That Do you think that the development of democracy in the United Kingdom has been instrumental in the prosperity that we've enjoyed and likewise in, in the United States and other countries? Or do you think that countries, when they become more prosperous, demand more m democracy? Mm, I think that's that's a, a, a debate that we could have for a long time. It's <laughs> that's why like... I asked the question, because I think <laughs> it's a very interesting one. <laughs> it is. It is. I think it's one of those... Um, it's one of those conversations like laundry. It has no beginning and no end, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it depends on where you look. If you look at China, I don't know. Do you see those indicators there? Um, uh, what do you see going on in the U.S. now? There are some uh, analysts who will say the U.S. is now an oligarchy. It's no longer a democracy. So um, I suppose it depends on what you look at and possibly what your agenda is. Um, very interestingly, at the beginning of the, the war in Syria, I was doing some work with some young, um, young activists, uh, civil society activists uh, from Syria, and we were talking about social contracts, and they were fascinated by the idea that such a thing could be developed. And we spent hours just talking about what was in a social contract and how it could be developed, and how it would be implemented. Um, so I don't think democracy is just for the wealthy. I do think there are certain minimum conditions around education and service delivery um, that make them work better. But I don't think money is the defining fa the deciding factor. No, I, I, I'm, I think I agree with you. And I, I think we're going to see over the coming decades um, a fascinating comparison between China and India, mm. with one having um, advanced much faster economically than the other, but with a totalitarian system. Whereas I think India has a much more soundly based level of economic growth, though it's been slower because of its democracy. And I think that will provide a great underpinning for ensuing decades, which China doesn't necessarily have. Mm -hmm. And that therefore, though they can happen at different stages, the move to prosperity and the relationship with democracy, democracy helps anchor prosperity once you've begun to get it. I don't know if you agree with that or you think that's a bit simplistic. No, I don't think it's simplistic at all. I, when I look at it in practice, I don't think it matters where the starting point is as long as it's organic. And there are um, there is a commitment to let it grow. Um, you do look at some of the policies coming out of, of the government of India uh, at the moment, and there is a sectarian nature uh, in some of them uh, as well. So again, we go back to um, that uh, the the perennial debate about uh, can you have uh, a divided society and a democratic society. And the power of democracies is amazing. It struck me very much that um, Prime Minister Modi was able to, to have a major change in the currency, taking all notes, all large notes out of circulation, which happened reluctantly but peacefully, whereas North Korea tried to change its currency and had to reverse because it re met with such an unpopular reaction. And that Democratic consent can allow the most remarkable changes to take place that sometimes totalitarian regimes can't achieve. And this is, I think, great power of democracy for change uh, rather than simply for maintaining a status quo. Mm, that's a very good point. Um, so perhaps you tell me a bit more about your work for the Westminster Foundation and how, how actively you help countries develop their democracy, what you do in terms of helping and facilitating exchanges and conversations uh, between different democratic nations? Mm. Uh, I, what we tend to do in the Westminster Foundation is to work in partnership 
uh, with parliaments, with civil society organizations, with political parties and political movements, who are, of course, key actors in making sure all these systems work, in problem solving. So, of course, as, as we've described, these are systems, these democratic systems are robust yet fragile, and they require a degree of eternal vigilance because there's always a new problem coming up. Uh, so uh, we start by working with our partners to identify a problem that we can find ways to solve together. Uh, and then we seek to bring in technical expertise. So we will have um, senior members of the UK Parliament, uh, senior members of, of the Parliamentary Secretariat uh, help to solve some of these. Uh, we have the political parties are involved in solving some of these problems and have been particularly effective in the last year in working on this issue of access. And I think this is one of the areas where we're finding a lot of our partners are very interested in addressing um, uh, this issue of who has access to political spaces. So our political party offices are working with some of their uh, partner parties on selection and election processes and uh, what the rules are to get through those processes and who actually makes it through. Uh, because this, of course, has an impact, a uh, knock-on impact in who actually makes it through the doors of parliament and what constituencies they are representing once they're there. Uh, how well the parties can work as a caucus in the parliament, work jointly, and the extent to which they are able to participate in the culture of MPs of public service, of cooperation, um, and of uh, accountability. Um, so uh, this is the approach is really one of how do we move from a system that's not working and design a path or a transition to something that is. Um, another area where we've had some really interesting work recently is on the political equality of persons with disabilities. Uh, we had, uh, while the UK was the chair of uh, the Commonwealth, the chair in office, um, a program working around the Commonwealth on different aspects of political inclusion. And a number of countries, our local partners, just, uh, said they really wanted to work on political equality of persons with disabilities. Um, also access of young people. So uh, in Mozambique, in Kenya, in Sierra Leone, uh, we have been looking not just at, at physical access, but the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the political dialogue and debate in political parties. Uh, in Nigeria, we are involved in the Not Too Young to Run campaign to lower the age at which uh, young people can stand for office. And how has that worked and, and developed? Perhaps Nigeria would be a good specific example to talk about. No, oh, it was a very successful campaign. It was, uh, it was a fantastic opportunity to mobilize uh, civil society and some of the political parties around an issue that you would know yourself when it's time for a society to make a change. Sometimes accountability and persuasion come a little bit from this issue of what would we be too ashamed to defend? <laughs> so <laughs> would we be too ashamed to defend that the minimum age, and forgive me, I don't have the exact age that it was by law in Nigeria, but it, I believe it, it was pretty high, somewhere around 35. If it was at that age and we were saying we need to be able to move it down to, to 25 or so, um, and so there was definitely an opportunity to run this campaign that had a lot of momentum, a lot of enthusiasm, work with a lot of partners. It brought in the parliament. It brought in senior political figures. And what you end up having as a result of that is a dialogue that goes on and relationships and networks that are formed, but also ways and practices of working with senior decision makers that had not been there before. So you, you blaze a new sort of neural pathway about, oh, these are the people I need to talk to when I'm trying to solve a complex problem. And you managed to get the age down from 35-ish to 25-ish, uh, which must have been an enormous cultural shift. I think it was. And you know, you're, this is also the case, right? The, the devil is in the details in terms of implementation. Uh, but we did have elections last year in Nigeria and had a record number of young people 
uh, elected who are now working to mentor some volunteers with WFD uh, on um, a course, a campaign that's being referred to as Politics with Values. And what they're trying to do is to shift the dominant culture around politics in Nigeria, which really tends to be around um, how do I use this opportunity for my own benefit and my own gain to one that is more towards those, those cultural values that we talked about of public service, delivery, and cooperation. Which is obviously always the aim of democracy, to try and encourage public service. Um, can I ask you an unfair question? Of course. Uh, which is, um, your accent and mine is a little different. It so they're is. possibly different political systems. <laughs> If you had to choose between the U.S. Congress and the U.K. Parliament, which would you choose and why? Mm. So I have not worked inside the U.K. Parliament. I have worked inside the U.S. House of Representatives. And if given the choice, I would choose the U.K. Parliament. The why has to do with the way that policy is made. I have found that the committee process and the standards in the U.K. Parliament are far more rigorous when it comes to having an evidence base around decisions. Uh, and I think that creates a better environment for cooperation, collaboration, and outcome-based decision-making, uh, and less sort of shouty politics, as it were. Well, I think that's a very tactful answer, because I've, I've always... Uh, been a great admirer of the American Constitution, and, and perhaps to be a U.S. senator is the uh, greatest thing possible to be um, uh, outside being a head of state. But uh, thank you so much. It's been really interesting, and thank you for the work of the Westminster Foundation for Democracy does, because it is, I think, globally important. And um, we do see that countries that are democratic become ultimately more stable and more prosperous to the enormous benefit of their populations. And you talked about public service, but I think what you do is genuinely public service. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for this opportunity. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. As part of its Western Balkans Democracy Initiative, launched in 2019, the Westminster Foundation for Democracy is working in Bosnia and Herzegovina to create an environment where women can participate fully in politics. The programme aims to support good governance by encouraging women to become politically active and improving their overall representation in government. Following my conversation with Shannon, I was delighted to speak to one of the parliamentarians who has been supported by the Westminster Foundation. My name is Lana Prolich, I'm 27. Uh, and I'm the MP of the Parliament of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, I was elected two years ago, so I have two more to go and then discuss about next mandate, maybe in, in the same house. Uh, I'm the, in the House of the Representatives of the Federal Parliament. Uh, actually, I joined politics when I was 17. It was 10 years ago when I joined uh, the youth of political party. And then when I uh, when I got 18, I joined the political party. And then at the age of 21, I became the youngest women politician to be as a vice president of some political party here in Bosnia-Herzegovina and I could say in the region as well. So I'm coming actually originally from Mostar. Uh, and since I did my... A bachelor and master degree in the capital Sarajevo. Uh, I was like half of the week in Sarajevo, half in Mostar. But even though I, I'm in the parliament, uh, which is concerned mostly in which headquarters is in Sarajevo, I'm actually representing my region of uh, Mostar and Herzegovina in, in this parliament. And the topics, and I'm actually the vice president of the Social Democratic Party here in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And how easy did you find it, both at, at such a young age um, and, and as a woman getting into politics? Were, was the red carpet rolled out for you? Were you very welcome? Or did you really have to struggle and um, find elderly men like me were getting in the way? Uh, actually, uh, not so much. Um, regarding the 
when I became vice president of the party, I was the only woman, uh, female uh, vice president. There were like uh, five or six other vice presidents who were male and also the president and also the secretary general of the party. And actually, I had really good uh, connection with all of them and they uh, supported me looking at me as their sister or their younger daughter. So, so I really had support uh, from them. So I, I'm not someone who had that stereotype uh, like a middle-aged male versus um, young women in that point of time. So I really had their support and actually in a lot of things when I got um, politically attacked, let's say that way, uh, in most of the cases, they would just say to me, like, Lana, you, you should uh, step away. We, we will do the job for you, you know, so because they are more wisdom and, and have more experience in that uh, bad part of the politics, you know. So so I, I really had like really nice uh, relation with all of them. So and they actually uh, learning, teach me how to do this job. Uh, being women by doing the, this job in a male way, you know, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yes. Um, so it sounds as if you've had a lot of support, but also you must be very driven. What is it that motivates you, that drives you to take on these responsibilities? Actually, when I when I accepted the the, the proposition to be the youngest vice president uh, of the party ever, uh, a lot of people told me like I, I totally lost my mind and. Uh, you know, there was like a lot of people who turned back uh, to me, even though they're really close to me, you know, because in some point of time, they assumed that someone will uh, propose them that position and not to me, you know. And then when I uh, when I entered all of that, I said, OK, now I accepted that that uh, that role. And now it's my time to give my best in creating myself as a politician in that point of time, uh, you know, because um, it wasn't like red carpet all over me, you know, uh, but uh, I had a chance to, to prove myself and to give ma maximum of, of me and got maximum from them, you know, and I used that like pretty much because I, in that point of time, I was just a student, you know, but I was working in a party, I was in the headquarters every day after my uh, classes are finished, you know. So I, I did a lot of sacrifice for this, especially when it comes uh, when you need to give up some huge things, you know, and uh, pay attention how you uh, how you behave and how you um, pr approach to people and everything else, you know. So I, I need uh, actually to grow up really fast in, in this job. And, and that seems to me to be a very important point, that as a politician, you're obviously scrutinized much more than other students would have been and other people of, of your age. Um, do you enjoy the scrutiny or is it something you've just come to accept? Uh, actually, I, I, I don't find that as a problem, you know. So I, I found that as a part of the job. And I think that every job, uh, if you love that job, uh, everything has advantages and disadvantages. You know, but I think that the biggest problem with a with with being politician is that everyone just sees your success, but not what is behind that. You know, uh, you perfectly know as well, probably that uh, this job uh, has a lot of sacrifice. For instance, every day you are sitting and talking and having long uh, meetings with the people that you might uh, don't like at all. You know, but people that you love the most as your family sitting home and waiting for you, you know. So those are uh, those advantages and disadvantages of this job. Y yes. Um, though I think um, sometimes my family thinks it's a jolly good thing if I'm at work rather than coming home <laughs> and stirring all my children up and getting them overexcited. But <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, um, yeah. Um, but uh, uh, um, do, you, do you enjoy campaigning, the cut and thrust of being out on the stump and making speeches and getting the voters out and that side of politics, which I've always very much enjoyed. Yeah, I really like campaigning. And this this year, actually, in two months, we are having local elections here in Mostar for the first time after, after 12 years, because the last elections, local elections that we had in Mostar was in 2008. 
And in that point of time, I was 15 years old and now I'm 27 and I'm someone who is who got the really big role in um, moderating all things regarding the election since I'm not the candidate, but it's someone who mm -hmm. is behind. But I really do like um, campaigning. And now, when I was campaigning for myself as well, two years ago, I was not sitting home or just calling people. I was uh, on the field with the volunteers you know, doing campaign door to doors, drinking coffee, uh, talking with the people, um, sharing leaflets and so on. So I really do like campaigning. And also one more thing about it, because all of my friends are mostly, my best friends are in, in a party as well, you know. So I call uh, my party and my organization someone who is um, family that I chose. You know, you got one family when you, when you, when you, got born and then you are choosing the other family of your friends and I think that people who surround me not just in the, in the party but also supporters are my other family. Yeah, I'm sure you're right about that that um, the people one works with in politics become an extended family and it's very much a, a team activity yes. and, and I know um, the Westminster Foundation for Democracy has been uh, working I think with you um, yeah. Have you seen a benefit from them? Because they're obviously trying to spread the benefits of democracy and encourage uh, particularly young women to stand uh, for parliaments. Yes, exactly. Uh, when we're talking about Westminster Foundation for Democracy, I could say that I don't have like strictly professional um, relation with, with the team here in Boston, but also pretty much like... Um, like a friendship with them, you know, because we are really, really small state and we all know each other, you know, so we are not like super official to each other, but uh, calling um, each other if we need anything and so on. So uh, one of, of, of the greatest things that I am really proud of working with the Westminster Foundation for Democracy is something is the research that they published uh, two years ago, I think now, or one year ago, it was about the violence against women in politics, which mm -hmm. I think is like a totally different view on the women in the politics. When we are talking about women in politics, we are mostly uh, talking about topics that women are talking about or how hard is hard is for them to be elected, but no one was talking about how hard for women is to be re-elected in a sense that they do not have any more um, motive to to rebuild uh, and to go for another mandate because of that violence that they have, you know. And that's where where I'm coming back to the to the, the question uh, that you got me uh, previously is that everyone sees politicians and someone who is really nice dressed, having all of the advantages and so on. But there is also the background for that, and that's also the violence against women in politics. And, and that's been a particular issue of yours, hasn't it, to campaign against violence for women, uh, against women in politics and to try and stop that. Do, do you feel that that is something that's improving and that partly in addition to the Me Too scandal, that the position of women in politics is more respected and more judged uh, on, on your merits rather than uh, on your sex? Uh, exactly. So, so basically after that research, I... I found out that I'm not the only one who had that problem, you know, because mostly women in the politics are not afraid, by, but ashamed to share their story because they're saying, OK, I'm uh, in more advantaged position than any other women, maybe because of the uh, paycheck and everything that you are having as a politician. But again, um, it doesn't mean that should be a part of your job. Violence should not be part of anyone's job, especially a public job. But for instance, it's really interesting here in Balkans to say that a lot of people are saying, OK, you're a public person. So if you're a public person, you should be prepared uh, for any kind of comments, you know, but that comments are mostly uh, becoming uh, violence. So there's a thin line that we do not still understand. But there is also a great initiative of the Westminster Foundation that they're working on the local level as well, uh, is making a new ethic, ethic codex of the of the of the parliaments on the local levels, and we are doing that as well in the parliament that I'm sitting in. Yeah. Well, that seems to me a fundamentally important campaign. And I was going to ask you to close with, what do you think of as your one ambition for your political 
career, if there were one thing you wanted to achieve, what would it be? I would like to, to, to finish and to adopt the laws that I proposed in the parliament. And I think it's really hard, you know, but I'm not giving up on that. And I also want to encourage another young women and not just women, but youth, you know, to enter politics and to change that wrong political culture that we are having here, unfortunately, for the last 25 years. And so changing the political culture yes. is the main part of your aim. I think it, it, it is because uh, I think that new generation uh, has has had that uh, chance, you know, to 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 really uh, change it in the sense that we should be more reliable, uh, more uh, communicating more between ourselves, you know, not just to be within our parties, but also to spread. Uh, the word and also to to see uh, the laws that are really good for everyone and not just to see who proposed the, those laws. Well, um, if you continue to be as driven in future as you clearly have been so far, I'm sure you will achieve everything you set out to do. And thank you so much for joining us in this podcast. I'm very grateful for your time uh, when I know you're exceptionally busy with your many campaigns. Oh, no problem. I'm honored, really, I am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both Shannon and Lana for agreeing to come on this episode of Why Parliament Works. Lana may have a very long career ahead of her, and I wish her every success. By contrast, my very special guest for episode 9 of this podcast was first elected in 1980 as a local councillor, but perhaps the most significant election of his life was in 2019, when his fellow MPs chose him for one of the most important roles in the country. Join me next time for my conversation with the right on Sir Lindsay Hoyle, Speaker of the House of Commons. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.